please take your Bible now and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 23. I'll be reading the 26th through the 35th verse in a moment from the New King James Version, which is the Bible in your pew rack in front of you. If you brought your own Bible and would prefer to use that, please do. This morning we begin a series of sermons on the seven sayings of the Savior on the cross, often called the seven last words, incorrectly, I would say, because they're actually sayings that Christ um, spoke, and they have uh, rich depth to them and speak to everything that Jesus stood for and represented in his earthly ministry and life. Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 26. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. So our theme verse, let's read it together, number 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Perhaps nowhere did our Lord unfold the deep mystery of redemption as at the cross. Now, most Christians are familiar with the resurrection account because we celebrate Easter year after year in which the account of the resurrection typically uh, becomes the main focus of the worship services. But not many pay attention to this season of Lent and to the whole idea of Christ's journey to the cross and the experience at the cross itself. But without the struggle of Gethsemane and the agony of Calvary, we would have nothing to celebrate on Easter Sunday because the Lamb of God would not have offered himself as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. So Jesus actually experienced two victories. The first was in the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. That was where the real victory was won. Then at Calvary, he offered by surrendering his body and blood as the propitiation, that which satisfies the justice of God's divine degree against sin. And all of this brings us to the first of the Lord's seven sayings from the cross. From their position in the uh, record that Luke has given us, they appear to have been spoken very early in that awful scene. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Now that means that the first saying of Christ from the cross was actually a prayer and not a speech. It wasn't directed to man, it was directed to God. Now none of us need to be reminded that Jesus had a very viable prayer life during his public ministry, he often uh, retreated from the crowds and their demands for prayer early in the morning to a remote site where he could be alone with the Father. 
Now, a few of us might expect that given the physical trauma of the trial, the mocking, the scourging, then being nailed to the wooden traverse beam, that you would expect something else to come from Jesus' mouth at that point. In fact, Cicero and Seneca, the two giants of ancient Roman philosophy from the 100th and the 4th century BC respectively, related that sometimes uh, before a person was crucified, they had their tongues cut out in order to prevent vulgarity and violent and blasphemous language used to curse their tormentors. We know how we ourselves react to suffering and inconvenience, don't we? But here was the Son of God without sin, with suffering, enduring the ignominious death of a, the worst criminal and simply raising his voice in a single one sentence prayer. How often we make prayer too complicated because it's not sincere. See, sincerity will shorten a prayer because we're getting right to the point with God. And that's exactly what Jesus did. What we can say about this prayer is several things. A, it represents an unbroken trust in God. Neither the betrayal of Judas nor the mockery of the religious trial uh, by the Jews nor the brutal civil trial by the Romans broke Christ's faith in God. That's because well before this day came, Jesus could say, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone for I always do those things that please him. B, it represents an unbroken trust and an unbroken communion with his Father in heaven. Prayer and trust belong together. Not a moment or situation came during his life on earth that Jesus didn't naturally turn to God as a plant in the window turns to the light. Jesus began his ministry with prayer. At his baptism, we're told that while he was praying, that's when heaven opened. Then before calling the 12 disciples, he spent the entire night in prayer. He offered prayer before the breaking of the bread to the 5,000 and the 4,000. And then he went to prayer at the grave of Lazarus just before he commanded Lazarus, saying, come forth. Now Mark's gospel records a very busy day in Capernaum lasting into the night, and yet early the next morning, the disciples found him deep in prayer. Sometimes during a crisis, we have inadvertently, including myself, said, well, there's nothing more we can do except pray. But prayer with Jesus was never a last resort. It was always a first resort, first on his agenda. And especially now, in the face of death, it was no different. Now, secondly, let's notice that this prayer that Jesus offered from the cross was not a petition for himself and it was not a petition for revenge. Instead, it was a prayer of intercession. Christ was asking God to forgive those, both Jews and Romans, and us, who were responsible for this great injustice. Jesus was now nailed to the cross. He was no longer free to move about teaching or preaching or performing miracles or the such. That part of his ministry was over. But now he could still perform his role as the only mediator between God and man. Now this ought to be a source of comfort and encouragement, especially to those of us who find ourselves getting older and we don't have quite the freedom to be engaged in physical activity like we did in times past. But who knows but what that God is leaving you here on this earth. And many of you ask me from time to time, why am I still here? But um, here's the answer. God is leaving you here for a few more days to be active in the ministry of prayer.
Now clearly this raises a question. If Jesus were God, why would Jesus be asking the Father to forgive them? On no previous occasion do we ever find Jesus making such a prayer. He never involved God, uh, the Father, in forgiving others. Instead, he forgave them himself. He said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And when the woman in Simon's house came and washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair, he said, your sins are forgiven. What then makes this situation different? Well, forgiveness of sin is a divine prerogative, which was specific to Christ's ministry while on earth. When criticized for creeling the paralytic, the scribes said to themselves, who can forgive sins but only God? They were right about that. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, take up your mat and go home. The man got up and he did what he was told. But now Jesus is not on the earth. He's on the cross. He's suspended between heaven and earth. And um, he is now representing us as our substitute. He's no longer in the same position that he might exercise that divine prerogative. Instead, he now assumes the position of an intercessor before the Father. And therefore, he cries out in prayer, Father, forgive them. He intercedes for sinners, and so must we. Now, this is the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 12, by the way, where, among other things, it was foretold that the coming Savior would make intercession for the transgressors. Now, in that verse, it is prefaced by saying, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. It should hearten every kind of sinner, each one of us, to hear this, because it says that the kind of God proclaimed in the Christian gospel is one who even in the extreme agony of crucifixion could pray to God that we might be forgiven. Can you grasp that? Can you hear Jesus plainly say without any double talk at all, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now at the same time, the thrust of the prayer to the Father in heaven is this. Father, forgive them. Why? Because they don't know what they're doing. Now who is they? Is it the Jews? Or is it the Romans? Or is it you? Who is it? After all, in what sense could it be said that either the religious leaders or the Roman soldiers at the cross didn't know what they were doing? What do you mean they didn't know what they were doing? It was the religious leaders who incited the mob when Pilate asked, what shall I do with this Christ? And they said, crucify him! And wasn't it Pontius Pilate who knew very well that they had delivered Jesus to him out of envy. And did Jesus mean to say that the Roman soldiers that were there at the cross and they were on the detail of executing criminals did not know what they were doing? Certainly they did. They carried out crucifixion with the utmost brutality. They were seasoned soldiers. 
Now, ignorance may excuse a boy in the slums who steals a loaf of bread because he's hungry, but a church member who starts to spread gossip that damages other people's reputation, or for that matter, the reputation of the whole church, and is patently untrue, can never use ignorance as an excuse. What then in particular was Jesus alluding to when he declared in this prayer that his crucifiers didn't know what they were doing? It had to be that they did not know or they did not have a moral appreciation of the significance of crucifying the Lord of glory. They were ignorant of the enormity of that crime. And yet they ought to have known. I mean, their moral blindness was inexcusable. After all, they had the Old Testament prophets who plainly pointed to the Messiah and what people could expect as he arrived on the scene. They could identify Christ as the Holy One of God. They had Jesus' teaching. They had his miracles. They had evidence right before them that they were forced to admit never a man spoke like that man. They had the example of his selfless life and of his going about doing good, always disposed to the service of others. Something else has to be going on here. But what? Well, for that, we turn back to the Levitical law, and we read, if a soul commits a trespass and sins through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flocks with the estimation of the shekels of silver after the shekels of the sanctuary, he shall make amends for the harm he has done in the holy thing and shall add a fifth part thereto and give it unto the priest and the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. That's not all. Then in Numbers we find, then it shall be if ought be committed by ignorance without the knowledge of the congregation that all the congregation shall offer one young bullock for a burnt offering, for a sweet savor unto the Lord. See, sin, how can I put this? Sin is always sin, whether I'm conscious of it or not. It's always sin whether your conscience bothers you or not. Just because our conscience doesn't bother us is no proof that we are free from the sins done in ignorance. Now, I recall many years ago after having called to this pastorate, I was down there in Coriopolis uh, on the main drag, as we say, and um, I went through two, not one, but two stoplights without stopping and I looked in my rearview mirror and I saw the flashing blue light and the orange light and it was only then that I realized what I had done. I was looking above on the highway for the lights to be hanging across. They weren't like that. They were on posts at the side and I was driving right through. And uh, I told the officer I was new to the city of Coriopolis and that I only realized after passing the second stoplight, which was the truth, that they were located at the side and not overhead. And he said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go and check your story out. He went back to his cruiser and um, in a few minutes he came back and he said, okay, you're free to go, but put your seatbelt on because that's another violation. But God doesn't lower the standard of righteousness. He doesn't chalk up our sin and say, oh, I, I, I realize it was an innocent mistake. Listen to what Paul told the Romans about the pagan background that they had come out of. He said, 
For his, that is God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. In other words, no one can ever say, I never knew there was a God. You can't do that. Because if you step out those doors and you look at the creation, it testifies to the eternal power and the divine nature. You can't dismiss it by saying, I believe in evolution. Who cares whether you believe in evolution or not? You have to explain what's out there. You have to explain what's up there. Can you come up with an answer? Now in this 21st century, we in America are even in a tougher position. We are more culpable or will be held more guilty than anyone perhaps ever in the history of the world. Look for yourself. We have an abundance of Bibles. We have an abundance of translations. We have an abundance of churches on every corner. We have pastors, preachers, and Bible teachers on the radio and television. We have religious periodicals and devotionals galore. We can get anything on our iPhone. Just because someone may be too lazy to open and read and study does not minimize, it only adds to the guilt. The guilt of ignorance. So finally, notice that Jesus Christ did not personally forgive his enemies on the cross. Likewise, in the Sermon on the Mount, he did not demand that his disciples forgive them. Instead, what he said was, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I'm saying to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. He never said a word about forgiving anybody. To be clear, Jesus said to pray for our enemies. He did not say to forgive them. And there's a good reason for that. Let's allow Jesus to speak more about it. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Notice, there is a specific condition that must be met by the offender before forgiveness is to be pronounced by the offended. The one who has wronged us must first repent. That is, the person must judge himself wrong and give evidence of his sorrow over it. But just suppose the offender doesn't repent. What then? Then in that case, I am not obligated to forgive him or her. And to do otherwise would be to condone the offense and fail to uphold the righteous requirements of God's law. Now I know that sometimes pastors are put in awkward positions. Something will happen in a church and they will say, Pastor, go and see so and so. They're alienated for what they did. That's not my job. Don't ask me to do that. The Bible says, if the person repents, I should forgive them. If they have not repented, then there is no grounds for my doing that. 
for welcoming anyone back into the church. Please understand that. But just so there's no misunderstanding, neither am I to harbor hatred and resentment toward that person. That's where prayer comes into play. Listen again to the Sermon on the Mount. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Prayer for the offender who refuses to repent Yes, by all means. Forgiveness for the offender who refuses to repent. No, not by any means. And all this raises the ultimate crucial question, doesn't it? What about God? Does God ever forgive any of us where there is no repentance? What if a person says, I know my lifestyle and I'm not going to change? If that lifestyle is dishonoring to God, if it's dishonoring to what he has taught clearly in the Bible, and you are not willing to repent, on the authority of this word, I have to tell you, God will not forgive you on the day of judgment. What will matter the most in the hour of my death, and yours for that matter, is this. Are all my sins still outstanding in God's court of law? Or have my sins been put away? And the second part of that question begs the answer. What is the ground on which God will put away my sins? Well, in the human court of law, the judge has to choose between only two alternatives when it comes to a person who has been proven guilty. The judge can either enforce the strict penalty of the law by dropping the gavel and announcing the sentence, or he must disregard the requirements of the law. One is justice, the other is injustice. The only possible way for the judge to enforce the requirements of the law and yet show mercy is if a third party enters the picture and offers to bear the offense of the offender. In that case, the third party must agree to accept the penalty that would have gone to the convicted. God cannot willy-nilly set aside the righteous requirements of his law and still maintain the integrity of his holy and righteous nature. So he has provided a righteous ground on which he can say to sinners, I will receive you, I will forgive you. And that third party which comes to my rescue and yours is his own son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believe is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. That was the preaching in the New Testament. Do you recall that incident a very sad incident where Samson came to his dying hour. Samson, one of the judges. He had been 
brought out now to be mocked at the celebration of a sacrifice to the Philistine god Dagon. Since his enemies had gouged out his eyes and he was blind, he asked a young boy to place him where he could put his hands on the main two central pillars supporting that entire temple. And when the little boy put his hands on the pillars of the temple, Samson offered a prayer. Very different than Jesus' prayer. He said, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me, with one blow, get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. In, in a sense, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he pushed with all of his might and down came the entire temple of Dagon with all of the people inside killing more in his death than he killed in his life. But Jesus, on the other hand, died a much more agonizing death than Samson. And from that cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. No, we don't. But when we hear the gospel and we, we learn who it was that bore our sins in his own body on the tree, we can say, when I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. That's what Jesus did. He prayed that prayer so that you and I could spend eternity with him. What a savior. Praise God. Amen.